So, so I'm just going to move to your younger brother, yeah, Ronnie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it might be related. Though. Yeah, well, you could be. You could be. So, so Ronnie, I just wanted to ask you why Malaysians are so humble because you set up uh, CreditWorks in 1998 and it now provides data solutions and finance outsourcing to 2,500 businesses in New Zealand. Yeah. Do you think it's a cultural characteristic that you're all so shy? Um, school. <laughs> First and foremost, I just want to put it out to, to everyone. Who in, in this room not, uh, know of the most famous Malaysian? Can somebody name somebody that they know? Lingo, Uncle Lim. Lingo, Uncle Lim, he's a, well, he owns casino. <laughs> well, <clears throat> there was one gentleman that was here recently. Uh, his name is Jimmy Chu. Mm -hmm. He's Malaysian. Um, Malaysians, uh, whether they're in Australia or here, we tend to be quite incognito, so to speak, we just get on with our lives, even in Malaysia. So I, can, I think to counter that, what we do is we work hard to, to you know, get on with life and, uh, and try not to draw too much attention to ourselves. And when we come to a country like New Zealand, uh, we carry on that same mantra. Um, and it's funny, when I, was, when I first came here, uh, I was working for American Express and I was working for American Express International. So it was owned by South Pacific Credit Card and Amex International was going to buy. So I came through and I was put in charge. At, at that time I was 22 years old. I was put in charge of uh, American Express uh, credit department. I had 27 staff, bloody about 22 years old. And one of my staff came to me and said, Ronnie, do you guys still live on trip tops? And I said, yes, we do. But the only difference is, we use escalators to go up these days. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, oh, okay. But it's all about ignorance because they've never been to Malaysia. And I don't blame that person because he's never traveled. He's only a 21 year old. Oh. And another example I have is, is um, <clears throat> I, I befriended this guy. We play squash every day. And we compete and things like that. So, you know, we go to the pub and have a few drinks every now and then. And I remember the pub is actually the corner of Carlton Hall Road. No, Carlton, no, uh, Carlton Pass and the New Market, which is called the Carlton Pub. And of course, back then, I was the only Asian, the only dark haired person walking there. I didn't think much of it because to me, everybody's the same, where they can play quite, playing doesn't really matter. And then one day I said, let's go, a young child, I'll take the young child. And at the time, there was only one restaurant, which is his and Martin and Road. So we, I took him there. We were having a young child. I went through, he said, you know what, Ronnie, I know exactly how you feel. I said, what do you mean? Because I'm the only white fellow here. <laughs> I said, oh, really? I said, why do you see the difference? So from then, I, I realized that there's a lot of it, ignorance and, and don't understand, you know, different cultures and all that. And today is a very different place, obviously. So tell me about the reflections <coughs> you were telling me about before, which is about what's happening in Auckland, what's happening in New Zealand, and about business, and whether or not business is really ready for what is happening in terms of demographic trends. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> um, it's funny. Seven yeah. I've got a lot of clients. We've got a lot of clients. And when I started my business, everybody said it was never going to work. Everything I did was green for you. But being somebody like myself who took no for an answer, so I just proceeded with it. Anyway, one of my clients, they turned over uh, $800 million a year, which is a significant size of business. The CEO came to me and said, we want to engage in the uh, New Zealand construction industry with the Chinese people. I said, yeah, fantastic. I said, uh, let's sit down and have a coffee. So we did. I said, how many reps have you got in Auckland? At the time, they had 15 reps. And at the time, I think the Asian population in Auckland was about 18 to 20% somewhere, which is significant by, by any means. I said, how many Asian reps do you have right now? He said, one. I said, what's that substantive of 15, which is quite wrong. I said, that's your problem. You don't have somebody who can engage with these people. And I said, have you traveled internationally on A New Zealand and all those stuff? He said, yeah. I said, OK. When was the last time you went to Hong Kong? He said, oh, not too long ago. I said, well, how many persons do you know on the planet that are of Asian origin that can speak the lingo so they can communicate with their customers? Know thy customer. He said, well, it's true. So what I find interesting is that we talk in, in business sense, we talk about wanting to engage with the Asian community, or whether it's Middle Eastern, or Pakistani, or Indian, or what, it doesn't matter where they come from. I think it's all talk, because when you put to action, then you will change fundamentally a lot of things you do. And 
terms of the structure, in terms of the people you employ, in terms of your website, and things like that. But we don't do that. Speaking of which, you know, I was in Malaysia recently. We were in Malaysia, my partner and I. And I hate to say this, but Australia is very good at promoting their varsities and everything else in, you know, back where I live, my hometown where my parents live. Next to the, the bus stop, there's a huge banner that says, come to uh, Sydney uh, Varsity or Perth University. Do you think I could, for a minute, try to buy New Zealand made goods, whether it's wine, beef, lamb? I can't find it. The only thing I can find is ice cream. So I thought to myself, why do we talk about ex export to all these Asian countries? But the reality is, to find those kind of products in, in, in Malaysia, then it's very talking is one thing, but I think we have to act uh, as, as, as a country. I love New Zealand. This is my home. I've lived for 28 years. Uh, I don't intend living anywhere else. Uh, I've got my crew of 20 people and things like that. I think the thing is that there's a lot that can be done. Uh, you know, there's all this rhetoric about Asian buying up land and all that stuff. You know, at the end of the day, is that if you go to every restaurant in New Zealand right now, particularly in Auckland, a lot of them got Asian dishes. In fact, um, Blue Brazil, they have this dish called salmon with salad. It's actually yi san. If you know what that means, is that Chinese New Year they have this yi san. And then they have this dish, they call it minced beef. It's actually my whole tofu. So I thought to myself, and they charge three times the price. <laughs> but it's funny, I take my European uh, Kiwi friends to, to these restaurants. Oh, it's lovely. Then I take them to a Chinese shop. They say, oh, it's the same. I say, exactly, but a fraction of cost. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the one that's being sucked in? You know, not me, it's you. <laughs> but I think at the end of the day is that, you know, this young friend of ours said to me, oh, Ron, you're doing this speech. You know, one of the things I fear about, about Asian is that you're buying our land changing our culture. I said, well, France have got Chinatown as well. Do you think the French start drinking tea now? No, they're still drinking red wine. You know, nothing changes. I think it's all about, my passion is, and I said to my parents, I said, oh, look, the passion I have is to try and educate New Zealanders to understand that we're, we're not a threat. We're part of society. We've got a lot to contribute. And in fact, the investment that we bring into the country, imagine if every Malaysian that comes to this country, like me, if I can do it, anybody can. Trust me, I came here with no education. Uh, I got my education here. Can employ 20 staff. Can you imagine how much prosperous we're going to be as a nation? I think Kiwis, you know, one of the things that I'm very critical of about New Zealand businesses is that a lot of businesses, they get to a certain point, they sell it for 15, 20 million dollars, they, they sell the business, they buy a boat, buy a badge, and then sell so, it. How many brands that we have in this country that are international brand. You look at Germany, you've got Adidas, you've got Audi, you've got all those. Germany export 80% of the world engineering products to the world. Our brand, national brand, is not terrible. We need to bring more national brand to the world because New Zealand is unique. And with that, we can prosper as a country and we can employ different, different, different types of people uh, which is going to create that much, that, that great uh, melting pot which is can only be good for us, you know. With 220 different ethnicity in New Zealand, we are one of the most uh, multicultural country. <coughs> for a tiny little country like New Zealand, Singapore is the size of Lake Taupo. It's got 4.5 million people. We, the size of three times the size of Malaysia, which has got 25, 30 million people, or four and a half million people. And so I think opportunity-wise for us here is enormous. Uh, I think New Zealand businesses got a lot to learn. There's a lot that can be done to attract all these businesses. A friend of ours worked for Mercedes-Benz. You know, one day we, we drove past and there's all these Asian people buying Mercedes-Benz. I said, hey, stop selling them because you're going to increase the price. In other words, I'm trying to be funny about Asian buying houses increasing the price. I said, all these Mercedes are going to be expensive, so us local poor people can't buy them or laugh. You know? But that's the, the reality of it is that when I first came here, a lot of Asians were living in Chawi, as we call it. <laughs> <coughs> now they're living in Parnell and driving Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Before then they were driving Audis and BMWs. Things have changed. A lot of people uh, you know, see them and I don't know whether it's envy, fear of the unknown, I'm not too sure. But as Sanju would say, do you know Sanju, they are wolves? When two white men argue, they're both one of them. When a white man and a Chinese argue, 
the Chinese will lose the sector of white man's face. Does that make sense? Explain. <laughs> <laughs> that means if two people, white men, argue, both trying to win the argument, both trying to stamp the authority and be better than the other person. Whereas a, a Chinese and a Caucasian will argue, the Chinese will deliberately lose to save the white man's face. That means who is a better person? Being humble. In other words, we don't have to win all the time. The fact is that we realize what the situation is, so we're being humble. Mm -hmm. so, so Ronnie, just, just in closing, talk about sure. that, those differences of culture, because I see it all the time in New Zealand. We come from an Asian culture and it's very structured and hierarchical. That's right. It's about respect and big face. But we are now in a Kiwi culture, which is all about we're all the same, you know, Jack's as good as his mate. And, and how are we going to bridge that gap? Okay. Because it's, it's, I mean, mainly it's because we just try to pretend it doesn't matter when, when people <laughs> treat us badly. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to bridge that cultural gap. There is, you're right, mate. There's a huge cultural uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not uh, short of experiencing some of those um, condemnation and criticism because I'm Asian. One of the biggest things when I first came to New Zealand 20 odd years ago was that a lot of my colleagues said, oh, my grandma has gone to rest home. To me, that was a foreign word uh, coming from Malaysia because the only time I remember a rest home in Malaysia was when I was at the Rotary Club when I was 16 years old at school. I belonged to the Rotary Club simply because I would join there because I wanted to help and also because my school in Penang, as you know, girls only come in when they're 17, right? <laughs> six four. So I thought the only way I can engage with these girls is join them because they're there as well. <laughs> Which was no good because I failed my as <laughs> but the only time I remember a rest home in Malaysia is when I went to this rest home to clean, sweep the floors, help the elderly, clean toilets and all that. Because I sense of I wanted to help. When I came to New Zealand they see a rest home, I thought, do you mean to say to me that as soon as your parents who have brought you up, sacrifice all their life for you, provided for you, education, everything else? Once they reach the for them to pasture like a racehorse. I say, isn't that wrong? Oh, no, 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 because we can't care for them. I said, well, really? Where else the Pacific Islanders, the Maoris, the Asian, all respect the elders? You will never see an Asian sending their, their parents to a racehorse unless they're critically ill in the hospice, which is a different story, but not to send them to, to, to pasture. That in itself is a huge challenge, a huge barrier. I think in terms of cultural differences, is it's all about education. It's, it's what you're doing, mate. Congratulations. This is this is hugely helpful. I think it's all about education. And now Lenten Festival, when you go, you see all these different things. You've got the valley, you know, you've got all these things. And education, to me, is, is hugely important. And the difference is that in Asian society, my grandmother always said to me, she passed away, unfortunately, that, Ronnie, with all the money in the world you have, people can steal from you. But with knowledge, nobody can. It's with you for the rest of your life. And I think knowledge is something that we as a society in New Zealand, um, we always talk about, oh, you can get a trade, you can do this and all that. But in terms of changing our society, changing our economy, as a country like ours, which we are huge innovators, we don't capitalize on that. We don't change our industry to a high-yielding industry, per se. And that's something we need to look to do, you know. And from a cultural perspective, I think, you know, we've got enough different people in this country that a lot of the industries that we come up with, we can flourish. And with that, I think it's tolerance, understanding of each other, culture, uh, the melting pot. And you know, I said to somebody earlier today, in 20, 30 years from now, you see a lot of intermarriages today. And I'm hoping that in 20, 30 years from now, that the kids that are kids today, <coughs> when they're 20, they're, they're not going to see any differences because the browning of New Zealand as a country, the color changes and everything else. When I first came, it's all predominantly white. <coughs> when you go to a restaurant, you eat spud and, and meat and, and three veg. You know. Now you've got char siu, you've got this, you've got that, you know, you've got uh, butter chicken, which we never had before. So I think that in itself will change over time. Um, and it's all about patience, tolerance, and understanding. <coughs> um, yeah. Right, excellent. So, can I just ask you to thank our speakers?
I asked a member of New Zealand Asian Leaders why they liked coming to this organisation and they said because seeing other Asians <coughs> succeed motivates and helps me and what we've seen tonight is two of New Zealand's top Asian leaders. I've never heard either of them speak and I hope that you found it as interesting and inspiring as I did.